Hey, welcome to Optimize Your Body with Martin Silva, where we talk raw, uncut facts to truly help you optimize your body. Hello, and welcome to the Optimize Your Body podcast. I'm your host today, Andrew Bond. Uh, myself and Martin are switching roles today. Um, it's nice to have Martin in the hot seat and have him do the talking for a change. How are you doing there, Martin? Good, thanks, Drew. Good. How are you doing, mate? Very good. It's a nice, reasonable time for me in New York today. It's around uh, six o'clock, so I'm uh, six p.m. rather than five a.m. So I'm a happy man. Time difference is a nightmare, isn't it? Yes, sir. So for me personally, I wanted to have this podcast today. I wanted to have a more in-depth conversation about competition prep and you being a renowned professional fitness model. Okay, you know you've been posting a lot on uh, Instagram lately in relation to doing your competition, uh, WBFF Pro Competition, in three weeks' time. So. It would be nice for some of the listeners to get a more in-depth conversation um, on what goes behind that and kind of your past, right? So we want to talk about that as well. So yep. I'm going to start with a nice, easy question, Mark. Okay, we'll go more in-depth later. Cool. Um, when did you first get into the world of men's physique competitions? So that was back in 2013. So what's that like? I don't know how long ago that is, six years ago. And it started out from just a few guys in the gym I was working at. They were like, you know, there's this new men's physique category now uh, within the bodybuilding, within the uh, IFBB, Bodybuilding Federation. And they said, you know what, you should give it a go because, you know, you've got that kind of physique where they're looking for, you know, the fitness model kind of men's health cover kind of look. You know what I mean? So I thought, you know what, I'm in shape pretty much all year round, although I wasn't, you know, I've been in in good shape since I was, you know, 18. I started lifting weights consistently from the age of 16. And even from the age of 18, you know, I was, fortunately, I've got good genetics, right? But I was very consistent from from 16. So I was the guy in shape, even at 18. So at this point, I'm like 25 and I'm in really good shape. And I'm not, don't really know a great deal about nutrition. And, you know, I've got age on my side as well. So I thought, you know what? And I thought, I'll give it a go, right? So four weeks later, um, didn't really know much, like I said, about the diet inside of it. Just made a few changes, ate more egg whites, didn't know anything. You know, I just followed some of the stuff Arnie was doing, ate more egg whites, more chicken breasts, didn't know what the hell I was doing. What's that? Yeah. So, um, and with that, you know, you're saying about you were in shape from a young age. Do you feel that your before you stepped on stepped on stage, do you feel that your physique was developed enough to be in that competition at that time, or do you yeah. think it was quite premature? Yeah, I think it was developed enough for the standards I was up against because, like, there yeah. was only nine guys in my class, and I came second, right, on my first show. So, I think for that particular show, my standard, my my physique was developed enough but I wasn't quite lean enough. If I'd have known more about the nutrition side of it and the calorie deficit, as we always talk about, then I could have dropped about another four or 5% body fat and potentially won the show. But I wasn't well-versed enough in that arena. And Right, so take me through like that, the early days of stepping on stage. Like, how did your confidence differ then, back then, to what it is now? Did you feel any fear or were you... But did it come natural to you going on stage in front of a packed house in, in uh, Neef, right? It was? Yeah, it was. And it was a packed house. And to be honest, that was out of the five IFBB shows I'd done with that, that federation, sorry, UK BFF. That was by far the best show. The atmosphere was electric in there, especially in the nighttime. But to answer your question, I was absolutely shitting myself. So getting on mm. stage, to be honest, and performing is not something I've got much experience with. It's not something I've been very confident with. But I think... Um, you know, being a personal trainer and kind of the lifestyle I've had, I've got good people skills. I've been, you know, a trainer since I was 19. So that really got me out of my shell in terms of my confidence. And also, I think being, being um, you know, well, I don't want to say an athlete, but playing sports from a young age. And, you know, we both played rugby from a young age and that camaraderie, camaraderie of, you know, having that um, team spirit and stuff like that. It, it builds your confidence up is what I'm trying to say, right? So playing sports and all that kind of stuff and taking the knocks in rugby and all that kind of stuff, you know, it does build your confidence up. And I had a big tribe of people around me. So I was a very confident guy. So getting on, but getting on stage was something new to me. So um, it was very challenging and I, I was crapping myself. I'm not going to lie for sure. Yeah. Yeah, and you yeah. won, obviously came second in that competition. You were fortunate to get to the British finals, right? So mm. from from advancing from that first competition to uh, that final, um, what was the biggest difference you could see in physiques of the other competitors? Oh, yeah. And even, just... Go on, sorry. No, no, go on. Finish. I was just going to say, and then even from that to advancing to obviously a different competition, um, but 
um, advancing from that to the pro level as well. Let's yeah. take, take me through the two differences there. Yeah, cool. So going from that show, obviously you kind of um, supported me and obviously you competed yourself as well, right? So you, yeah. the second show I did, the uh, British finals, I come second in that show, as I mentioned then, the, the, the first show I did, sorry for the listeners, I came second. And then five weeks later, this wasn't planned, but I qualified for the British finals. So I thought, you know what? I got the itch for it and I just went for it. And that really is when things kind of went downhill, but also made me who I am and made me the person I am now on this podcast talking and um, having the knowledge I have really because I've had to really apply myself as a result of building up an extremely unhealthy relationship with food and, and developing a binge eating disorder. So that five weeks, right, before I go into the standards of the athletes, that five weeks between the first show and the second show I did is when I started really restricting foods. You know, I had an old school bodybuilder um, give me a plan. I'm not going to mention his name. You know who he is. He's from your, your yeah. ends in Wales, from the valleys. Yes, sir. Um, but um, yeah, and he just, you know, he was just an old school bodybuilder. Didn't really uh, teach me anything. He just said, right, eat this. Turns out when I look back, I was probably consuming around about 1,500 calories a day, uh, maybe a little mm. tiny bit more. And I was, my output was through the roof. So it was like, it was way too big a calorie deficit. You know, the maximum deficit you should have really going into a show is like 20%, maybe 25% tops. This was like a 40% deficit, right? So for the yeah. listeners, you know, let's just say my, 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 to maintain my weight, right? I would need about 3000 calories. I was having around about 16, 1700 calories probably. And I felt yeah. like shit. And I was eating the same foods every single day, which is not necessary, following a black and white diet plan. And I got absolutely shredded. And that, on the plus side, and that's when I actually discovered that I had a 10-pack, which was bizarre. <laughs> let, me just, let me just talk about that quickly. I've never really, uh, really spoke about this or thought about it, really. But I went from like having a, diff- like a six-pack to completely different shaped abs, right? And 10 of them in the space of about three weeks. It was really weird. I was like, I got, I, I must have dropped about, I don't know, about six, seven percent body fat within that five weeks. Probably more, actually, probably about eight, nine percent. And yeah, it just peeled off the layers of body fat. And I realized that actually, if I um, flex my abs in a different way, so I kind of blow out rather than tensing and bracing, like we talked about the other day, just kind of blowing out and, and stretching my abs out, out a little bit more. I actually had 10 abs, which was crazy, right? That was a crazy experience. Um, but then I, yeah, I was just restricting my food. And then, as you know, I did the show and I was a little bit naive because I didn't realize how much uh, steroids were floating about in that category because yeah. obviously it was supposed to be the, the the kind of healthier category where it was like a, a healthy fitness men's health kind of look. But when I turned up that day and I was backstage, I was like, Jesus Christ. Some of the guys were just massive, full. And I was just like, okay, I've been a bit naive here. And the standards were, to answer your question, the standards were much, much higher. And then after the show, as you know, and you were there supporting me, that's, that was the biggest binge to this day I've ever had. I think we mentioned yeah, it before. Awful. Talk them through it, Drew, quickly. Um, I was due to do a competition myself, so I'd kind of uh, done one probably two to three weeks before, right? Or maybe a little longer, maybe a month before. And uh, I was due to do another one uh, probably a couple of weeks after the uh, British finals. And um, I felt, obviously I'm slightly biased, but I felt Martin should have done better in that show. And a few other people were saying the same thing. So Mm. when Martin didn't win the show or come in top three, I was like, right, bugger this. I'm not going to do the show myself. Threw down my uh, <laughs> threw down my chicken and rice, which I was eating at the time, chicken and brown rice, <laughs> and just scooped out a load of. Uh, you had a big cupcakes, tub of probably like a, a kilo the, of almond uh, peanut butter, right? That's right. But the first thing, we had, the first uh, stop was the big cupcakes. Remember those giant cupcakes? And you yeah, you would do remember with the ice cakes, in, with the ice in, and you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was a, it was devastating, and we went from <laughs> we went from uh, rice cakes with peanut butter to cupcakes to um, what's TGI Fridays? TGI Fridays. Um, Binge there. We Binge, had, yeah. uh, we, had like, we had like we had like we had a starters and mains. We had a dessert and we had an Oreo shake. Yeah, yeah. And, I remember uh, it vividly because then we went granola, back to the hotel. Granola, granola, we got back to the hotel, right? chocolates, um, full breakfast the next day. I think we had a full breakfast. Okay, that's just it wasn't. Buffet. It was more than a full breakfast. We're looking at like four thousand calories, right? This is this is a like everything you can think of, right? 
And then in yeah. the car, all the way home, we were just eating chocolate. Out. Oh, mate. And we went to um, Just Brazil, right? Uh, Viva Brazil, yeah. Same. Yeah, so just, yeah, Viva Brazil. We had every meat on the... Um, buffet. On the menu, besides one meat. Uh, mm. Had the buffet, salad buffet, potatoes. Then we went out, drank. Then we came back to your place and we had a large Domino's each and a tub of Ben & Jerry's to each. polish it off. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think you continued after that. I continued the next day. Next yeah, day I went on for, I went on for about a week. It was because you were shredded to the bone. I wasn't. So for exactly. me, it was probably good to stop there, right? Remember, I was, was a mess. Can you remember this? Well? Remember I had that, but that cut? I had fucking... I burned my... <laughs> Mate, Andrew turned up at my house a few days before this show, guys, right? And I had a cup of uh, just being stupid, clumsy as I am, right? I had this flask and I didn't do the flask up properly, right? I had hot coffee in there, poured it all over my face, bloody burnt all my uh, chin. So I had this, just to top it off, I'd been binging. I was obviously on a downer from not placing. I think this I had, was before the, that was before you got on stage. Remember you had a... Yeah, kind of I had to get all makeup on it. In terms of confidence, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, let's talk about... Scab, anyway, go on. Let's talk about um, the concept of you being a national, uh, natural athlete, right? You mentioned steroids earlier, right? As, you know, performing at the pro level is completely unheard of, or you'd think being a natural athlete, right? So I know you're a huge ab- advocate of demonstrating to followers they can build a fantastic physique without using any any aids or anything like that. You know, what's motivated? What's been your main motivation to stay natural, knowing that taking something might give you that extra edge over the competition? Mm. First of all, I'm not going to lie. I have been tempted several times, right? <laughs> Absolutely. And you probably have been anyway, right? Just as, yeah. as we, we've talked about before, just being driven by insecurities. We were both skinny kids growing up, skinny teenagers. You know, you want to look good. You want to be in good shape. And a lot of people where we're from take steroids, right? It's the norm yeah. pretty much, right? So it's you're readily available. Readily available. And you're always tempted. You've always got that devil on your shoulder, right? But... I never did it because I was, like I said, because I was so consistent. I had, I guess, because I'm quite lucky in a sense. I'm not going to lie. Obviously, the hard work, consistency, and all that kind of stuff is number one. But, you know, genetics do load the gun, right? But it's that hard work which kind of pulls the trigger. But I've been fortunate enough to have those genetics where I started training at like 14, got really consistent from 16, where your testosterone level, you're basically on natural steroids, right? And at that age. It's like yeah. natural steroids, right? Your testosterone levels are through the roof. It's like Mount Everest of tissues in your room because you're uh, just because <laughs> you, you know. You <laughs> won't go into that, but um, yeah. yeah, I think people know what that means anyway. Yeah, they have, yeah exactly. They have kids, they've, they've experienced it themselves. Don't worry. Exactly, exactly. So um, yeah, so go, just to, just to talk about that, you know, I was consistent. I was in good shape, and then I decided to myself, you know, I don't need to really. I just kept kept fighting it off, and then. Um, but by the time I'd done that first show, I was oh, I was in great shape, you know. I went traveling for like five months, lost a bit of shape, but you know, obviously I was in no, I lost quite a bit of my shape, but I got it back really fast. And that's when I kind of, when I was 22, and I got back from traveling 23, actually, uh, I just responded really well. And that's when I felt like, wow, it looks like I actually am on steroids now. So again, in your early 20s, your testosterone levels are still high, you've still got the age on your side, and because I was in such good shape, I just didn't feel as much of an urge. Um, as other people to do it. And I guess, I think as I got older, I got a bit more secure. I was still insecure in my early 20s, but in my teenage years, I was much more fragile and I was much more tempted in my late teens to do gear because I was I was basically more insecure. You know, I still, in my head, I was still a really skinny teenager. So when I looked in the mirror, I still had that dysmorphia where I would see a skinny kid looking back at me. Um, so yeah, once I got through that barrier um, and into the next chapter, it was, um, yeah, it was a lot more smooth sailing then. Nice, right, so and that's one of the reasons I asked you earlier, you know, did you feel your physique was fully developed enough to step on stage? Because I know that there are people out there listening to this who are tempted by steroids, right? Mm. But they haven't given themselves enough opportunity to build their best physique, right, without using anything. They haven't programmed efficiently for themselves. They haven't dialed their nutrition in. They haven't trained effectively. And they're already looking to take or are taking steroids. But I feel like, you know, that should be a last resort for you. If you've tried your best and you've you've pulled out all the stops to build your best physique and you feel you're still not where you want to be, then maybe that's when you might want to use them or not, you know. Mm. But uh, that's that's kind of the way I, I um, alluded to that question earlier, mate, you know. Exactly, yeah. Um, and that's the thing, you just, just to clarify what you said then, you said, you know, you might want to use them. There's nothing wrong with saying that because, um, you know, we're not against people who take steroids. We're not against them at all. Like, we have nothing, like, we're not trying to be on our high horse here, but what we're saying is, 
take care of the big rocks first because the most important mm. thing is Andrew mentioned all those big rocks then you know training properly being consistent eating right you know sleep is the foundation people don't prioritize sleep and yes. like when you talk to people about this it's not sexy and it's mm. not a fast overnight you know or one week results like you would get from taking steroids and that's the thing for anyone listening to this especially guys right who, who attempted to take gear or are taking gear you know you really need to just stop chasing the fast you know do it the right way and not the fast way as we always say right exactly man. and let's discuss money Matt. everyone wants to know about money these money, days money, right money. so you're you're a pro you're a pro fitness model right so you yeah. should be raking money in from i'm a millionaire yeah, I haven't told yeah. the listeners that. It's that easy? Yeah. Made millions. When you turn pro, like the checks just didn't bounce. So I made, my bank, honest to God. I was, yeah, well, I, made, I was a millionaire in the space of, I couldn't believe it. Nah. Um, in reality, you don't get paid shit. So it's the only sport, bodybuilding, for the listeners, that it's the only professional sport as well where you don't get paid directly, really. Unless you're at the top level and you're Mr. Olympia level and you're winning Mr. Olympias. Uh, even, even guys who compete at that level, right? They get a lot of money from sponsors and supplement companies and they create their own clothing brands but a lot of the money they make is off their own back and it's the same thing as as me really right so we don't just for the listeners just to clarify this now because people do scratch their heads and they're like why i don't understand why they do it because another thing is the problem is with the competition world is when you look online and i've, I've noticed this more and more um people kind of whinge a bit too much about it, right? So there's this extreme, right? So you get people are like, oh, I'm really happy all the time and I love competing and it's just all sunshine and rainbows. And then you've got the other people then who are just whinging about it all the time, right? And just like, it's all such a grind and like, you know... So in the trenches people, and this and that. Exactly. And don't get me wrong, I'm going to post some stuff now where cuz we'll talk about this, but I, I did struggle a lot last week. But it, you know, it's 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 about doing it for the love of it, right? And also having a bit of a game plan. So for me, when I switched federations, just to quickly go over the last uh question, when I, I after five shows with the IFBB, I switched over to WBFF and then I this is the comp- the federation I compete with now. Uh the first show I did with them, I came second, just missed out on my pro card. The next show I did, I came first out of like 40 of the European Championships, got my pro card. But the pro card is just literally a certificate, right? And it's a status. So, you know, you're into that pro division. You don't get paid shit, right? Just to clear that. Um, but what, what I was, my goal was then is like, right, now I want to kind of push the online stuff. I want to get more traction online. I want to get more attention and eventually build an online business of my own, you know, through online coaching and selling the programs and whatnot, which is where we're at now. So it was all kind of part of my plan um, to, to actually eventually, you know, get some financial gain out of it. But it didn't work out as I wanted it to. And it wasn't like I was, once again, very naive when it comes to business, very, you know, not experienced really when it comes to building an online business. And in my head, I was like, right, I'm going to get this pro card now. Then I'm going to, you know, I'm going to get all these opportunities. Like people are going to be banging my door modeling contracts it doesn't work like that right so uh for the most part people if you see people online and they're sponsored by settlement companies and they're doing competitions and you, it looks like they're making a lot of money some of them might make out they're making a lot of money as well you know like and that's not to hate on people you know but some people do make out you know you'll see them next to a ferrari which a lot of the time they've rented out um <laughs> you know what i mean so just bear that in mind for the most part no one's making any money out of this yeah, I'm glad you uh, touched upon supplement companies as well. There, eh? um, so let's <laughs> delve a little bit deeper as well into your relationship with food. Right, you mentioned we, both of us, we've had binge eating disorder and, and orthorexia, things like that. What you know, but let's let's your relationship with food in the early days of your career. Right, um, at that time, were you aware of any of the issue of the issues you had with food, or was it just normal for you? Yeah, I wasn't really aware. That's a great question, actually, because I wasn't really aware until I, um, well, I guess when I look back, I just didn't used to eat generally growing up. We said this before, but I didn't really eat like healthy foods. Most of the food I ate growing up as a kid was processed. Um, but then when I, when I did my first show, um, leading up to that, I'd actually built up a better relationship with food. So I was actually just tuned in more to 
Like, okay, like he, he, eating salmon, chicken, lots of vegetables, and more, and, and less, like virtually eliminated gluten at this point, because I just realized I felt a bit better. And also dairy as well, I realized I felt a bit better. But that's about all uh, I knew, really. That's about kind of the level I got to, was like, I feel better when I don't have gluten and dairy, and I also feel better when I eat more vegetables. But back then, I wasn't really thinking about that. I was just doing it. I, did, I wasn't aware, to answer your question. Um, but then, like I said, it took a turn for the worse in between those two shows. Um, so the first show, all good. Leading up to that second show, restricting calories, eating the same food every day, chicken and asparagus and some walnuts or whatever I was eating and then we had that massive binge and obviously you kind of nipped it in the bud and, and when you went, went, went off on your own wherever you went then back to I think you were living in Australia Australia I escaped yeah I that's why you escaped to Australia mate, I had to just... go on the other side of the world <laughs> <laughs> um, and then basically mate um, for that whole week I was binging um, and I got to, I remember getting to the Friday, mate, and I was, I was doing some chest press on the machine, mate, and I had a dizzy spell and almost passed out. That's how mu- how bad I pushed my body with the binge eating. Uh, and that's when I realized I had a bit of a problem, you know? Uh, but even so... Go on, sorry. No, go on. You, sh- even, you showed, so you showed a denial. picture the other day on Instagram and, and it was full of, you know, um, heavily processed foods, right? You used to make lists of foods that you wanted mm. after shows and restaurants you wanted to eat at. And Definitely. Tell me about that, you know? That's exactly right. That's That's what happened next then. So... That's when I realized then leading up to, I, I, don't, I think the next time I competed was the following year. And um, I was making a list once again, just like I was the time before. I was obsessing about food. I would lie in bed at nights thinking about all these different restaurants, uh, Ben and Jerry's. Honestly, basically like a, a fat person, like, you know, no disrespect, but like a fat man in my body, like literally trying to climb out and, you know, get a better of me. And I would make lists and I would obsess and then when it got to the the two, I done two shows back to back. After that, once again, then a massive binge. But but even even in the, like the year in between those shows, that's when I really had the worst relationship with food, and it really started escalating because I was um, Monday to Thursday, I would basically struggle. I thought in my head, right, if I eat just my chicken and veg and my meat and vegetables mainly in the, in the week, then I can eat what I want on the weekend. And that was genuinely what I was thinking. I was thinking, this is quite healthy. It's fine because you're, you know, you're eating clean in the week. Like a lot of people think now, but it really doesn't work yeah. like that. It's, it's not like that, is it, And No, and I think, you know, that, that, um, that can be related to most people that we work with. Um, you know, the weeks are fine. They Again, they're restrictive and then, they don't realize how much damage they actually do on the weekend. You know, they're in a calorie deficit mm. um, during the week. You know, everything's going swimmingly, and then on the weekends they party, and then that leads to um, eating, overeating, mm. um, and then they outdo all that hard work they've done during the week mm-hmm. um, on the weekends in one day or two days. And I think it's it. You know, we need to realize it takes time to build up a healthier relationship with food, right, Mark? You, you know, mm. it's been a long process for you. You were going through these type of eating disorders. And now you're a much better place. Definitely. Let's talk about how was, how was your mental state during that time? How were you feeling, um, you know, psychologically? Were you go, going through anxiety, depression or anything like that? Or were you, or did yeah. you just feel? Do you know what? I wasn't actually going through depression, anxiety at the time, thankfully. Yeah. But I was, um, I, I kind of was really. Like come, come Monday and Tuesday, this mm. is kind of how bad it was. I would have like a food hangover for like two days. Yeah. I'd have a hangover on the Monday. I'd just feel rough on the Monday, like just mental clarity bloated Tuesday you know what it's like if you have a binge on the weekend you could be holding water for like up to three four days and I'd just be bloated to like the Tuesday Wednesday and by the time I'd actually got to a Thursday or Friday I'd be cracking again right so this is very extreme for the listeners and I think um, a lot of guys don't really talk about this as much right but I just wanted to flip this round to you as well and because we can both identify with this right because you've yeah. been in a similar in a similar place right Oh, of course, mate. Yeah, it was probably pretty much the same as you. I think we kind of egged each other on when it came to the weekends, right? <laughs> uh, we, you know, we we had some serious binges then. At the time, I I didn't really recognize it. Right? I just felt like it was the norm to do, right? I felt that I was good in the week. Then came to the weekends, maybe a Sunday. Then I'd have a quote unquote cheat meal. But unfortunately, it wasn't just one meal I would have. Um, I couldn't just see her as a burger and fries, a just normal meal, and just move on with my life. I felt that because I was so restrictive during the week. I then had to eat as much as I could during the weekend because I knew that for those next five days, I wasn't going to eat those bad foods again. So that was it was just my... a vicious cycle, really. Mm. Well, that would happen. I would. Oh, I was actually a lot worse before, before that time, before that period. I was probably would go three to four months without eating any, 
what I deemed at the time as bad food. So I would just be so strict for like three to four months. I wouldn't allow myself to socialize with other people. If family were having a meal, I would just sit there and not eat. This is pretty, looking back, it's ridiculous thinking about it Mm. and how that affected relationships with those around you, which we'll delve on later when it comes to competition prep with you. Mm. Um, It just causes kind of tension and stress stress and arguments. If I had known what I know now, at that point, I would have probably, I've been in, I'm in much better physical shape now and mental, mental shape, if you can call it that, um, f- from where I am now with my relationship to food than when I was then. I felt that I was doing the right thing by not eating those foods. Mm. I felt, hey, I'm better than everyone else. I can restrict myself and, you know, I'm, I know better than everyone else. But really, it was very unhealthy for me to go through that process and not build up relationships with those around me. So mm. it was lit- I would literally think, right, I'm going to go – even when I was away, like you, you saw me when I was away in Vegas with you and I was eating pretty much yeah. healthy all that week. And then when I got home, then I would have a little yeah. binge. And but when you say healthy though, right, it's not necessarily healthy. Yeah, it wasn't healthy. Don't, don't no, get me wrong. Yeah. Looking back, it wasn't, but at the time yeah. I felt it was. You yeah, know yeah, exactly. I, and, you were eating like, you know. for example, I can remember we went to McDonald's, right? We're going to McDonald's and stuff. And like I said, I've always grew up eating processed foods, right? I've never really, it was only, an, it was only when I really like, uh, when I really started it was kind of, just to, just to clarify, just to like uh, verify this now. Leading up to that first show, right? That is when I really I started connecting to. Uh, it's only now I've realised that I started eating healthier leading up to that show. But that wasn't planned for the show. It just I guess it was a bit of a coincidence. Uh, but leading up to about twenty five, my diet was terrible. But it's interesting because your journey is a little bit longer, like more prolonged than mine, right? Because you were doing mm. it. For, for quite some time right but yeah I remember yeah. We're, we're at McDonald's and we're all stuffing burgers and whatnot. and Andrew's there with his nuts and, and oats right I don't yeah. even think you would have yeah you did you had oats yeah in McDonald's that goes to show how extreme and obsessive yeah. you were mm. right and, and what was the reason behind that and it was to keep your abs looking sharp right yeah I guess just wanted to look <laughs> good on the beach mate. that was it that's all it boiled down to you were shredded in Vegas mine but how did you feel better mentally now. How did you just just try and think I about? I felt it, great felt. in Vegas because I was drunk all the time. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> I certainly, I, mean, I certainly during that time, that whole period, it was certainly bouts of uh, depression, most uh, most definitely, mate. Mm-hmm. Um, probably from that for that reason, it could have been work related, but it probably was a lot of it was linked to overtraining. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, being uh, monotonous with it, and mm-hmm. you know. Um, yeah, definitely during that time period, it, it must there must have been a correlation between the food I ate, not socializing socializing as much as I should have with friends and family during that time because of that. Mm. You know, I'd miss out on social occasions. That means you're not talking to as many people, mm. and that just builds up builds up sadness, I guess. Mm. Yeah, that's exactly uh, what happened to me. Because, but that's the thing. That's what's interesting though with you is because you went extreme because you weren't even competing really at these times right yeah so exactly that's the that's the the hardest thing about it looking back now it was not i had no particular goal in mind other than i was playing rugby but you know i was turning up to rugby as i was very fit like i was one of the fittest people there i, I would say um but i wasn't preparing for a competition i wasn't preparing for as i am now a photo shoot or anything like that i had no reason to sit out on certain occasions or not eat during certain occasions because I had like you have now like a competition coming up. Mm. It was just it was just psychological. I just felt that I shouldn't eat certain foods. Mm. And it's time you never get back, right? And you don't realize that at the time. You never get yeah. that time back. That's one thing even money talking about money, you know. You can make you can grind hard making as much money as you want, but you just always got to always got to uh, this is just kind of like a comparison. Always got to remember the time you never get back, right? Time is the enemy, right? In a way. So yeah. what's it called? Um I was just going to say then I was the same. I was but it was when I was competing, right? So I would be this is the thing. It would almost be extremes. I would be um Actually, no, come to think of it, right? Even when I wasn't competing in between shows, when I had this really bad binge eating disorder, I would actually stay in on weekends. I would stay in with my girlfriend at the time, and I would, when I, it's weird, I'm just having an epiphany now. I would stay in on the weekends rather than going out and drinking my mates, which in reality, it wasn't like it was benders. It was just a few drinks, yeah. casual social with mates. And I was like, I want more of that euphoric feeling, really, from eating foods like Domino's and Ben and & Jerry's and, and watching Netflix because I've restricted my foods all week. So come to think of it, it wasn't just leading up to shows. For those whole two years where I was competing on and off, I was sacrificing relationships and time on the weekends just so mm. I could kind of 
you know, worked hard on the week, relax on the weekend. That was my justification, you know, from work. So, but really, when you're pumping loads of shit food into your body all weekend, is that really relaxing and nourishing your body? It's not, is it? And you're Probably not socializing. Not, and we didn't connect the, the relationship side to it, did we, back then, to health? You know what I mean? So Yeah, exactly. As, as overall health, right? We only yeah. saw how we looked, yes. and, that, and that was it. And let's talk about um, your relationships with uh, people around you when you're during prep. Like, do they suffer a lot because you are so uh, fixated on that end goal? Are you, you know, do, you know, are you angrier? Are you arguing more? Are you more tired? Do you have less time for people? Obviously, you can't go out and eat. Yep. As often as you you would like to, right? You have mm. to prepare all your meals. How does that affect your relationship with those around you? Do you know what? For example, yesterday I met up with two of my mates over yeah. over this uh, pub, local pub, and it was just because I haven't saw them for a while. And I was really, mate, I was really dying to just cancel it. I was like, why did I agree to this? You know what it's like when you're prepping for a comp, you're like, oh, I got this energy, right? Obviously, you know, PT and some clients as well in the morning. I'd already been speaking to people, training, and you're trying to, you, but I, because of what we know now about the relationships and the interactions and how important it is, especially because I live out in Australia and these two boys are from Wales, mates I've known for a long time. I was like, no, I'm going to make it a priority. So I turned up, met them. My one mate ate a pizza, right? And most of this is probably thinking, oh, that must have been tough. It really isn't now. Because of the journey we've been on now, I no longer crave those foods. So those processed foods, I still have a bit of addiction to, don't get me wrong. There's trigger foods, which I won't keep in the house. You know what I mean? Like I won't have those foods in the house because I still have the addiction. But if someone's eating a pizza in front of me, like I, if that was me competing, say, two, three years ago, I would be f- angry. I'd be sitting there yeah. and I'd be like, how could you? And I'd be taken out on them. I'd be In my head, I'd be like, how the fuck can you eat a pizza in front of me? You know what I mean? But it was yeah. totally fine, mate. I was like, I wasn't even tempted. Um, and I'm so glad. I, mean, I sat there for like two, three hours and I felt great, mate. I felt totally fine. And um, yeah, like this time round, other than last week, which I'll uh, quickly skim over, last week was tough. Um, unfortunately for my girlfriend, she sees the worst of me. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. it's like you come home, live in a one bedroom apartment and yeah. like, you just want to be kind of on your own and you don't want to speak to anyone. And like, she would just ask me how my day was. And I'd be like, Oh, like even, even that was irritated me last week. So that, that was, that, that becomes was, more prevalent when you're dialing down to those single digit, uh, body fat figures, right? Yep. Yep. Close to prep. So that's going to get a little bit harder, but I think you're probably in a different place now because you are allowing different foods into your diet that you probably wouldn't mm. normally have. Yes. Uh, when you prep before, you know, I, I'm, I'm just imagining, or I know what you had before was just plain chicken, broccoli and white potato. Definitely, mate. Asparagus. You know what I mean? So at least you're, you have more variety now. Mm. And I know that you're saying that let's talk about your health as well, because I know your health during this process has probably been affected a little bit when you're mm. focusing on aesthetics how is that, you know, how is that different from previous competitions, but also how is that affected during this process? Yeah. So the four pillars of health, right? Let's run through them. Sleep. My sleep has suffered. Last week, my sleep suffered a bit because I was trying to do too much. I was still trying to keep on top of the social media stuff and all the rest of it. And I wasn't making my sleep a priority. So I was going to sleep a little bit too late. And then I was, I had two really nice bad sleep because I wasn't like winding down before bed and I felt like crap. And then uh, that was a knock-on effect then. And then if we talk about, you know, the relationship side of it, I was being miserable and short fuse of my girlfriend. Um, I was not really wanting to speak to people as I'm normally quite outgoing. I didn't really want to speak to people and, and communicate with many people around me. And then if I talk about um, the nutrition side of it, I mean, you know, that was totally fine. But I was just, I'd, I'd cut back on calories. So that kind of, um, I, I, I wanted to cut back and get kind of ahead of schedule because my, my, my weight loss and fat loss has slowed down for a week or two. So I must have been kind of under-reporting my calories a little bit. There was something going on there. And just for the audience, right, you know, when people say, oh, you know, inflammation and like, oh, I'm holding water and, oh, you know, I've got this hormonal issue. Most of the time, 95% of the time, people are under-reporting calories. So you're eating too much, right? As simple as that. And that's what was happening with me, mate, you know, because I was putting it down. You know, it's like, and you put it down to, oh, water retention. Then two weeks later, you're like, you're still the same weight. you got to do something here. Do you know what I mean? So Mm -hmm. I ramped it up for a week, but I think I went up a little bit too much. And that's where the psychological side got the better of me. And so I, I yeah. went harder than I needed to. It was probably unnecessary in terms of how much I cut back. And uh, now I'm ahead of schedule. But my health, all in all, took a big hit because I felt like shit. And I mentioned all those things then. Relationships, sleep took a hit. 
And then as a result of that, then by the end of the week, I just felt awful by Saturday. The worst I felt, man, like my libido as well. That's one thing I'm really tuned into now. Um, normally, you know, I'm, I'm not going to talk too much about that. I'm decent. I've got a sex drive, right? Nothing, <laughs> decent, right? Decent in the sack, is it, man? I'm decent in the sack, mate, you know? I, <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to... Blow your own trumpet, literally. Exactly, mate. Well, I'm not going to say anything, but you know how it is, Drew. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but no, come Saturday, my libido is absolutely dead. Normally, there's something there, dead right? Too. It is something there. Like, in the week, I still feel a bit dead. So my testosterone levels must have just because of the lack of sleep and all the rest of it, drop right down. And I tell you what was mad, Drew, is on the weekend then, I got to Sunday and I hit maintenance calories. So I had a boost. I had loads of cholesterol, you know, the animal, uh, the chicken liver yeah, yeah. And, saw that. and lamb Lovely. hearts I was eating. I tell you what, People mate, love that, I'm sure, listening to this. I know, love it. It's a required, uh, a quiet, is that the right word? Sorry, uh, a quiet taste. Yeah, it is. It's a oh, funny old taste, that, right? It, it I don't is. mind the uh, lamb liver. I like that. The chicken liver is pro- a step too far for me, right? It's, it's lamb just liver the, is about. I don't mind the first bite, but as you chew and chew, it just, I don't know, it just puts me off a little bit. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm right by the fridge here now, look, just for the listeners. It's a lamb liver there, look. <laughs> Wonderful. There you go. <laughs> 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 what else you got down there, man? I've got all sorts. I've got a sheep's arm at the bottom. I've got a goat's leg there. Big <laughs> I've got a guy's head in the chiller. I've got it all going on there. <laughs> Whatever it takes to win, right? Exactly, that's it. Um, yeah, talking so about I, your, you were talking about earlier, you, you obviously you thought that your, your calories are too high during that brief period. Um, Let's talk to this about clients as well, because if they see a, a slight change on the scale, they may do what you did in that situation and kind of panic a little bit and then just change everything drastically, right? Mm. Yeah, that's yeah, not that's right. the correct thing to do. It's, it's, sometimes you just need to be consistent with it and things will change eventually. Obviously, it's different for you now you're going into contest prep before the average listener who is just looking to get in shape or lose weight. Mm. Sometimes it's best not to panic and you know and just throw every, everything but the kitchen sink at it. Definitely, man. And that just reminded me, you done a, you typed up a great blog on this, and we need to add that to the website on the weighing scales. But yeah, like to, to anyone listening, the scales, even now, knowing what I know, they can still get a better of you if you obsess on the mm. scales. So the most important thing to mark progress is really to firstly to focus on uh, the health markers, right? And, and performance as well. I think that's a big one. Um, when you focus on just journaling your workouts, if you can, if you really focus on when you're in the gym, maximizing, being productive, not going on your phone in between sets, getting in the zone, making a note of the weight you're lifting, and really trying to progress in the gym, it switches your mindset then um, to focusing so much on aesthetics, right? Right. But when it, you know, most of us do want to look better, right? So when it comes to focusing on the aesthetics, right, to get results, um, take pictures. I reckon every four weeks. Don't take them every week. Take a picture and watch what happens if you focus on your performance in the gym. Uh, you focus on eating right most of the time. You take another picture in four weeks' time. You follow the, you know, you follow, you do ideally a full body training regime for about four weeks. And boom, watch what will happen, right? Just, it's quite simple, but the weighing scales, I think, can be a poor marker in a lot of ways. And I mean, they do have their place, yeah. but. What do you think? And people can be quite meticulous with that, right? They'll, they'll weigh themselves every morning, but we know that that can be altered by sodium levels. Um, have you eaten out the night before? Yep. Your water intake? Have you been to the toilet? There's so many little markers that will change and, and vary that for you. Definitely. And let's talk about, obviously, people, I said people being meticulous with the weigh-in. How about like um, issues such as orth- orthorexia, right? And and you now, it's different for you now because you're going into a competition and you're you're weighing everything to the gram. But what about your average person who is in this kind of is stuck in this paradigm where they just weigh everything to the gram and and they you know everything is uh, written down and they have to be perfect. Like how does mm. that? How is that? Exactly. Yeah. And and like that's the extreme version, right? Is weighing everything everything to the gram, all of your food, and that's very common where people get really kind of really. I I understand. Like it does have its place as well. I wanted to put that out there. You know, I mm. do get some of my clients to weigh their food, some of them, but it's it, it, you have to like Andrew and I have been training people for a long time, and you have to really adapt to the person. You know, most people I think weigh in their food not really necessary some people you know people who 
kind of are just a bit more sloppy with things and they're not really, you know, it, it can be handy at the start at least to like weigh their food. But the thing is with the fitness industry is, is always extremes. So you see this a lot now is where you'll look at people again using social media as an example. You'll look on social media and you'll see people who look really fit and healthy and they're in great shape all year round. But something has to give. And a lot of these people do get obsessive. So they have to, cardio is a big one, right? They mm. have to do cardio, especially people who've competed and, and they've had like, you know, online coaches and they haven't really learned much themselves because they've always had, had coaches and they'll do cardio all year round. And that is their regime. So they're spending, let's just say, let's just say half hour a day doing cardio, right? Now, over the space of the week, that's three and a half hours a week, which in reality, it's not necessary to stay in shape, but they have to do it because it's kind of the orthorexia thing, right? Kick it in there. Do you see what I mean as an example? Yeah. So mm-hmm. that's and an- let's talk about, you know, you have obviously have a lot of uh, experience working with clients, right? You've had mm-hmm. some uh, clients on your roster from people looking to lose weight to someone who wants to be more athletic to... Um, for a show as well. trainer for competitions right yep. so what's the difference between training clients for competition and your average clients yeah generally based on my experience um it is a lot easier prepping some for a comp generally mm. but this can swing the other way it's extreme yeah right? I, so, I know you've had experience in the past where it swung the other way you've yeah. been talking to me about it with certain people who are you know that's right. I remember, I remember i was talking to you about that guy yeah. Yeah. Oh man, that was a ball leg. Like you know, so you've got mm. to kind of select now. Nowadays, obviously, and we, both of us, we kind of select a bit more who we want to take on yeah. because it can become a lot more stressful, a lot more. Uh, it can do more harm to us than good when you're coaching someone like that because they have issues, which um, you need to pick up on right off the bat, right? Like you know, yeah. behavioral issues with food and you know just mental issues, right? Which you need to be aware of. So um, I've had a, an example, a bad example of someone I prepared for a comp before. Oh God, man! He was just complaining about everything. Everything he would—he would basically he had an eating disorder, which my fault, right? I didn't—I didn't, I didn't yeah. ask enough questions at the start. He had an eating disorder. He was just complaining all the time, uh, constantly ridiculous, honestly. And he would—he would just binge, and then he would take it out on me uh, and mm-hmm. all this kind of. Oh, and it was like a bloody relationship, mate. It was like Dude, having a worse than a, lot, a, a girlfriend. <laughs> but a lot, uh, <laughs> don't say that too loud. <laughs> nah, I'm only messing. Nah, I'm only messing, guys. Don't take um, offense. Think about that. You Girls know, even. most of the time, those, those, no, you're not. Uh, <laughs> um, so most, most of the time, um, you know, the people you take on, uh, who are looking to do a competition are probably the people who need the most help with their, uh, mental health. You know, some of them are just doing that competition because they know, they don't know any other way to stay in shape all around. They feel that they have to do competition to get lean. Right. Mm-hmm. So for the most part, some coaches shouldn't be taking these people on because they already have low calories um, they all, they're already overdoing cardio. They already have eating disorders, as you mm. mentioned just then. Mm. So, Definitely. Yeah. Know, all, all, yeah. Go on. As a coach, you know, sometimes we, we need to be, we need to be referring these people out to psychologists, not to a, a, a fitness coach, right? Or a nutrition coach. Yeah. I'll talk to you about that now. And, uh, firstly, I'll just finish about, um, the difference between like someone, for example, who's preparing for a competition, someone who's already in shape and they want to take mm. it to the next level and get on stage to the average person. Now I've trained, you know, everything from kind of semi-pro athletes to, you know, old age pensioners. And the bottom line is, um, adherence wise, behavioral issues, as, as we, as Andrew brushed over on the last episode, uh, when it comes to getting abs, for example, and getting leaner and getting healthier in general, you have to slowly change behaviors and that can be quite difficult. So for the average person to say, for example, someone who doesn't like vegetables, let's just say there's a lot of people who don't like vegetables, getting them to eat more vegetables consistently, right? That can take a long time, and it might never happen. Mm. It, might, it might never yeah. happen for a lot of people. So then if, if it doesn't happen, which does happen a lot of the time, some people just don't adhere to that. They don't, they, you know, and there's nothing you can really do. about. There's only so much you can do for them to actually make these changes. Then you can change another behavior. Let's just say, okay, you're drinking one liter of water. Let's bump you up to one and a half liter and be consistent with that. And when you, you, you start slowly changing those behaviors, you know, the average person then gets generally amazing long-term results, right? 
but yeah. you know it's it's kind of 50 50 it really depends on the person um but when it comes to prepping someone for a comp you know most of the, a lot thankfully a lot of the athletes i've coached they're very disciplined very consistent um and i i was after after learning from that one guy um they were a lot had a healthy relationship with food didn't have mental issues and they would just follow it to a t and if i'm honest yeah. mate, it was kind they of the easiest money. Yeah. yeah, they're the easiest to look after, right? Because you just Definitely. give them a plan. They don't bother you. They get on with it, and that's it. Whereas, yep. you know, for most people, it's, it's, it's a much longer process. That's why when we're coaching people, we try and tie them in for at least a three-month period because we know that it's going to take that time and more for creating those behavioral changes that you just mentioned there, right, Mark? Mm, mm. Give me an and example. Talk, There's a guy who listens to his podcast, and, um, and I think you're, you're coaching him now online, right? Who's that? Andy, uh, is it? No, is it is a uh, I don't want to mention his name now. I don't know. He'll be all right. Um, R- Rocky Kelly, you know that. Dude? Yes, yes, Andy. Yeah, yeah shout out. Great. Oh, it is Andy. Shout out, Andy. Yeah, yeah, he's, um, sure he's a big listening. fan of the show, so um, I'm happy to be coaching him. And it hasn't been too difficult working with Andy. He's been great, actually. Yeah. So um, you know, he just wanted to learn a lot more about the training side of it. Um, you know, um, activity levels how to dial in his nutrition a little bit. He's, you know, he's, he's always asking questions and I'm happy to lend him a hand, but he's, he's been a great client. He's been, awesome. um, yeah. So how's your, how's your approach with, so with like get, getting in, for example, like we won't talk too much about, but how for, me, like- it's, it's, for me, I'm, for me as a coach, it's not about me dishing out, um, giving him like a, a black and white plan. It's for him to try and work things out himself, right, Mark? Because mm. doing that process, I want him to learn. I don't want me to go, okay, Andy, these are your macronutrients. This is why you should do this. This is why you should do that. I'm on hand to answer questions that he does have, but I do also want him to think for himself as well. Otherwise, he's not going to learn anything from the process. And when I stop coaching him, he's at um, a dead stop, then he's not going to be able to know anything himself. So he's going to be back to square one. That's My exact, main aim exactly. is yeah. for him to handle it for himself long into the future so he doesn't have to rely on me yep that's it that's and exactly that's what i was trying to extract out of well. you then yes, yeah, yeah you know you know f- was it f- give a man a fish and feed him for a day um you know teach him how to fish and f- uh, feed him for a lifetime right that's what it's about it's yeah. about teaching people and that's why i think uh, the audience need to be aware of is like a good coach is someone who's going to guide you, uh, give you all the correct information. So, and then that's very valuable nowadays. The information and uh, the correct advice is very valuable because there's a lot of mainly bullshit information out there now online, especially with fitness and nutrition. So it's hard to sift through all of the shit, right? So, um, but it is down to you to obviously make the changes. And, and Andrew's approach is exactly my approach, is to teach people um, the right way to train, you know, get them to focus on the big rocks, as we mentioned, straight, straight away off the bat. You're normally asking them how their sleep is, right? Are you sleeping well? Yeah. You know, you, do you wake up in the nighttime? Do you dream at night? That's a big one for, you know, you don't mm-hmm. want them to talk too much about their dreams because that can be a bit weird. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> if, you, <laughs> but if you, you know, let's give it with Andy's, he's given me great feedback and, and it's great as a coach to, to like get, you know, get solid feedback from your clients and, you know, some of the biggest things I've I've heard from him is that he's trying our new uh, program and he's, you know, he's feeling better. People are giving him compliments, like his posture has improved. Um, you know, so these are these are some of the things that I like to hear from clients, and that means mm-hmm. I'm doing my job correctly. Still a long way to go with him. Yep. Um, but it's it's a good start, man. And let's talk about like obviously, you know, how is your your um, training differed this show to previous shows and, and where's the paradigm shift shifted with you with your training yeah so now I'm you know what it's better this time around because last time for the Wolves I changed my training program and done something different where I think in reality it's probably split in heads but I do think in reality if I just stuck to what I was doing training the full body like I am now I would have got better results and so now The main thing that's changed leading up to this show, right, um, aside from the training, is the posing. Right now, unfortunately, I was on that. I was I was on another podcast, Chris Spearman. For any of the listeners, it's only a few episodes back. Go listen to it because I recorded it and, and posted it on mine. It's Shred with Science with Chris Spearman, very successful online coach uh, and cover model, and actually he's a scientist as well. And we were talking about this, and I didn't mention for some reason the main thing I'm changing is the posing. 
So that is where I came undone last. Although I still got top ten in the world, right? Um, on the on the on the pro stage at the world championship. So to get top ten in the world and not get it right is pretty damn good. So I'm still happy with that looking back. But obviously at the time I was pissed because my posing I didn't get it right, and that makes a massive difference. How you a huge in fact it's. One of the main things on stage, next to bringing the condition to the stage, the physique, you've got to present it properly. You've got to present your physique um, properly to the judges, show off your strongest areas. If you can, hide some of the weaker areas. Um, and that's the way to do it. So this time around, I've hired a, a better posing coach, and I feel so much more confident. And also, you know, the good thing, and is. I haven't competed for over three years now, and you really do realize that actually my physique has developed a lot, especially my legs, so I don't have to actually do as much now in my posing. Don't get me wrong, I'm still working hard and flexing the shit out of every muscle, but I yeah. don't have to overthink certain angles and stuff now because, for example, my quads are much bigger, which makes my waist look smaller, uh, my shoulders are wider. So I haven't got, because a lot of these guys on stage, don't forget, their waist will be four or five inches smaller than mine. Uh, that's another thing. Genetically, my waist isn't built for this kind of sport, right? It's like mm. a 34-inch waist. So even when I come down and get shredded, it'll probably be about 31. Um, but because I've got, you know, I've developed muscle over the years, it gives the illusion that obviously my waist is smaller. So uh, main thing is the pose and hands, but also yep. training with less intensity, as you mentioned before, mm. and more frequently. So it's always the right. same message. That's what I've done, and that's no bullshit. Lean up to the show. Less intensity and hitting the body parts more frequently. Even if that, yeah, one more thing, mate. If I was, yeah, like yesterday, for example, I was tired and I just done a really light pump on my legs in the gym using machines, really light, done some mobility. And like, I never would have done that before, Andy, because I would have been panicking, mm. thinking, shit, I'm not yeah, doing well, enough. I'm done enough, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. exactly. And even the same with your cardio, right? You've mentioned that you're not doing any planned cardio leading up to the show, you've just been tracking your steps. Now, again, if you had done that years ago, you would have panicked as well, right? You wouldn't even know. You wouldn't even thought about uh, picking your knee up or, or doing more steps. You, that wouldn't have been part of the plan, right? It would have been, mm. am I either going to do some high-intensity intervals or I'm going to step on the cross trainer and do 30, 40 minutes of work? Exactly. And all I'm doing is just making sure I hit 15,000 steps, and that's it. Yeah. Yep. And your, your physique is responding pretty well to obviously more frequent frequency with the training. absolutely shredded. From, from going from like 10,000 steps to 5,000 steps, this mm. is what we always talk about, but the listeners need to be aware of the power the five to of ten, these right? bloody Fitbits, mate. It frustrates me because um, it's, yeah. it's, I get the fact this is the best tool out of everything I use with clients. Um, most people, they don't want to take five minutes out of their day to track food. They just don't want to, right? So yeah. with, with the Fitbit, you put it on your wrist, and, you, and you, you're aware of how many steps you're doing, right? And I went from 10,000 to 15,000, which is probably an extra, I don't know, 30 minutes of walking a day, and I've got shredded, right? I haven't changed right. nothing else. So, you know, obviously I brought the calories down slowly leading up to this, but I was eating like 4,000 calories, right? So I slowly brought my calories down to 3,400, and then rather than taking the calories down again, I just bumped my steps up. Uh, and I have taken the calories down a little bit more now, but the main win for me was the extra 30 minutes of walking a day, mate. So, and that's an easier, you know, going for a light walk is much easier than doing 10 sprints on a treadmill or a bike or something like that, especially when you're dieting yourself down to these low figures, right? 100%. Mate. Listen, mate, we're going to have to wrap this up soon because I'm running out of time. Yeah, Any... I got you, mate. Um, uh, we, we're having a good chat tonight, so I'm enjoying this. But uh, what advice would you give someone who, who's looking to get into men's physique or fitness modeling? Unfortunately, we had some technical difficulties with the last, say, three or four minutes of the podcast. But just to answer Andrew's question for the audience, now, if you are considering doing some form of, whether it's bodybuilding or men's physique or bikini, getting on stage, then it isn't for everyone. So what I did say on the original version of the podcast was you need to have a good relationship with food before you consider doing it. And what I mean by that is not eating a great deal of processed foods. Now, even using like protein bars and most protein shakes and lettuce, unless it's organic, whey, grass-fed, and there's just four or five ingredients in it, which is, you know, quite hard to come by, they're still processed foods. So I was actually pretty much hooked on these things, right? Because I was having like at one point six scoops of protein a day. And what you're chasing is the flavor. You're not chasing the protein because if, if that was the case, you'd have a chicken breast or some chicken thighs, right? Now, they're still 
very tasty, especially protein bars and stuff like that. So just avoid those kind of foods as much as possible. Still look at those foods as processed foods. And when you, if you are going to prep for a show, prior to actually starting your prep or considering doing it, just make sure that you're eating primarily whole foods most of the time. So you're okay with eating, you know, meat, vegetables, you know, for your carb sources, sweet potatoes, some rice, quinoa, oats or whatever, just whole foods. And that doesn't mean you can't have any treats on prep or if you want to have a cheat meal, although I hate using that term, that's totally fine. But the bottom line is, as I'm talking now, I'm exactly two weeks out from my show and I have not felt the need to have a cheat meal all the way through my prep. And the reason being is because even when I'm not prepping, I don't really get the urge. I do like to eat foods like, you know, which are not very ideal for me, but it's made with whole food ingredients. For example, if I have ice cream, I tend to go to this uh, healthier vegan place. Not that vegan place is necessarily healthy, but I'll go there. There's four ingredients in it. There's like dates, cashew butter, um, one or two other things. And that's what I'll have as ice cream as a dessert. And I'll probably eat too much of it. I'll have three scoops every time. Um, But yeah, for example, I was going to go for a pizza the other day um, because I felt, oh, you know, I've earned it. But then I thought... You know, I'm not getting any nutrients out of that. So I went to this uh, steakhouse where they do all good quality kind of grass-fed meat. And I had a naked burger, which was lovely. And I had loads of cheese, um, loads of meats, just veggies. So I had a big feast, uh, but primarily lots of meat and cheese. And then I had some ice cream afterwards. So, you know, you shouldn't really feel the need and urge to have those kind of foods regular if you're prepping. If you do... Most of the time, what's going to happen then, and this is not just talking about protein bars, this is talking about crappy foods that we feel like we need to have a quote unquote cheat meal or cheat day with, um, you're still addicted to those foods. And when you, you know, when you get to, it's going to be much more miserable, um, firstly, prepping. And secondly, you're going to most likely rebound really bad afterwards, you know, like I did several times, um, as I talked about earlier in this podcast. So I guess top tips. Make sure you've got a good relationship with food. Make sure you've got a good relationship with fitness in general, exercise in your body. Because if you're training primarily to look better, if your main priority uh, right now, anyone listening, is to train to change the way your body looks, and that's number one for you before anything else that comes into it. So you're not even considering all the other benefits you get out of it. Like you feel better mentally when you train, you tend to sleep better you know, all this kind of stuff that happens. And then you do look good as a side effect. But if you're, if you're not considering any of those important health markers, which are really important for us as, as humans, exercise is something which if you ask me is an essential part of, of most people's, as of everyone's lifestyle. If you're not looking at those important markers and you're just focusing on how you look, that's not a good mind, uh, state of mind to go into a show with. So all that's going to do then is cement in if you've got, you know, if you're training because of any insecurities like Andrew and I uh, were in the past and like a lot of people are, you know, a lot of people are insecure about certain ways, uh, certain parts of their body and they want to improve that. And there's nothing wrong with that. But if that's what your tunnel vision is, then let me tell you, it's only going to get worse after you've done a show because you're being critiqued against other people in great shape. Um, and you're going to be, you know, even now I'm looking in the mirror. My girlfriend picked up on this yesterday. She's like, you know, it's, you're so obsessive. You know, I'm looking in the mirror. I get up for a pee early hours in the morning. I'm looking at my abs, you know, going back to my old ways. But it is that maybe that's not necessary, but most of it is necessary. You have to have an obsession when you're getting on stage and you're going to get up and, um, you know, hopefully win, right? You want to get up there and compete with people who have you know, most people have put the work in and they're not playing games. So you have to be a bit obsessive to get up there. Um, and that's that really. So just don't even consider doing a show. And one other thing I'd like to mention as well is, um, building your metabolism up. If you're going into a show and you're having to, you know, for a woman, you're having to cut and get lean on say anything lower than I would say ideally anything lower than about sixteen hundred calories, right? If you if you're having to go lower than that to get lean for a prolonged period, that's just not ideal. You haven't built your metabolism up. Um, 
you know, you, you might want to improve your daily movement, increase your daily movement if that's your case. You know, if, if you're having to go that low on calories for a prolonged period leading up to a show, because that is going to screw with you mentally for most people. That's not, you can't really have a life really eating anything less than that. Um, so the people I prep for shows, women, for example, I like to get their maintenance calories up to at least 2000 calories, you know, before they consider doing a show. And that involves spending a few years building muscle, but also integrating more daily activity into your lifestyle, more movement, more walking. So that way then, you know, your maintenance calories are higher and you can get leaner much easier. Uh, you know, and for guys, if you're having to go into a show on anything less than two and a half thousand calories as your maintenance, again, it's going to be very tough. So it's the same, it's the same thing really. So build your metabolism up, build a relationship with food, get a good relationship with yourself and with exercise. You know, you shouldn't be trained in the gym to punish yourself because you've overate on the weekend. You should be training because you love your body as cheesy as that sounds. Right. Um, and I guess that's kind of it really. Um, I'm sure there's one or two other things I can think of, but they're kind of the main points. And with that, um, if you could go follow Andrew and I on Instagram, I am, at Martin Silva Fitness. Andrew is at Mr. Bond Fitness. And I mentioned this in the last podcast, but please feel free to drop me a message, a direct message, if you listen to this podcast, because it's hard to pinpoint exactly who listens. So feel free to reach out and say, hey, I listen to your podcast and give me your feedback. Um, that would be great. Just send me a direct message on Instagram. is easier. And I guess that's a wrap. Thank you for tuning in, folks, and we'll see you next time.